This morning's sermon is going to be on, we're still looking at the concept of walking by faith and not by sight. And this morning we're going to be looking at finances, okay? How do you walk by faith and not by sight in your finances? I mean, that was something like, trying to get my head around this, you know what I mean? I mean, what, what has finances got to do with our faith? I mean, it's just money, right? Mammon. Just stuff you, you get and you, you give it to someone else and they give you food or you give it to, you know, whatever and you pay your mortgage and all that stuff. But what's faith got to do with it? Where does faith fall into money? It seems like the two don't fit, you know what I mean? Money seems to be a, a common topic in many conversations in America today. Our economy is hurting, therefore many people are financially hurting as well. Anybody hurting out here financially a little bit? Just, you know. So everything's great. You don't need any more money. All right. I tell you what, we're in a blessed church, aren't we? Amen. <laughs> As Christians, we know that God is our source of security, not the economy. Nevertheless, many Christians have found that their finances have often been adversely affected. Okay, when you go to the grocery store. Who hasn't gone to the grocery store and went, Last week that was a dollar. It's now a dollar fifty. It's now two dollars. I'm like, what, what, what's going on here? Oil went down, so it be, ought to be easier to truck the food in here. How comes it's costing more and more? Seems like somebody's out to get us. I don't know. Well, there's six things that we want to look at. Okay, I found six things to look at where it finances and faith come come together okay the first one is to be thankful the second is don't stop giving the third is do what you can and let God do the rest the fourth is don't make excuses the fifth is do not worry. And I'm going to slow down a little bit because some people are writing these down. And finally, the last one is whose money is it anyway? So those six things that we're going to touch on as I go through this, this teaching this morning. And there's two words I want you to kind of remember as we go through and we're, and we're looking at all these different points Sources and resources. Is it a source or is it a resource? What are our resources? What is our source? Having a joyful attitude. Don't you think we need to have a joyful attitude when we give? Do you think um, God notices when you, you give? Wherever you're giving, whether it be in the church or into other people's lives, but mostly I'm looking at financially. So you think when you give money and you give it kind of grungily, like, oh man, I don't really feel like giving $60, but I guess I have to. And you throw that $60 down and you grumble away, oh boy, I could have used that $60 for something else. I should only give 20 Do you think God notices that? I think he does. I think he really does. Have you ever given and kind of grumbled about it later? And I'm not asking you to answer that. But in your spirit, I want you to think about that. Have you ever given when you didn't really want to? You know, there's, there's things that we do in our lives. And they bring about hurts to our spirit and I think that's one of them when you give begrudgingly I hope that's a word begrudgingly you know I don't really want to give but I'll give it anyway you know what I mean the, the usher has to combine he's pulling the offering right out of your hand and getting it in the, the plate you know what I mean God wants you to be joyful when you give you should be joyful there should be joy in your heart I learned this a long time ago, and I looked at, I've been in a lot of different churches, 
since I left the Catholic Church way a long time ago, more years than almost can count. Um, and I always saw this, this process happening. God would bless a congregation, right? He'd fill their cup over, whatever size cup it was. And I've been in some big churches and I've been in some little churches. And that cup would get filled up, right? And the churches that took that cup and took a sip and then emptied some of it out into other people's lives, you know what happened? They emptied the cup. And God went, oh, I have an empty cup. And he'd fill it up again, right? And they'd start over. They'd take a sip, and then they'd go out, and they'd pour it into other people's lives. Everybody gets a sip, and he'd empty the cup, and God'd fill it again. But I noticed at other churches that when their cup got filled up, they went, oh, we got a full cup. Well, I don't like empty cups, so I'm, I'm not going to do nothing with it. I might take a little sip, but I'm, I'm going to hang on to that cup. It's full. Who likes a full cup? I like a full cup. Okay. But the churches I saw that did that, there was no blessing. And if you think about it, it's, it's natural. If the cup is full and God tries to pour more blessing into it, it just spills out. It gets wasted. It doesn't get used because the cup is full. So God doesn't fill cups that are full. And I've seen it time again. So I want you to think about that. You're a joyful giver. Let's give it away joyfully. Don't hang on to it. Even the blessing in your life, don't hang on to it. Give it away. Because God will come back and bless you again. There's a scripture in Philippians about being thankful. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. I'd like to go there. I have to wet my finger. This, this, this new Bible, the, the pages are so new they all stick together. Anybody having that problem yet? Oh, I get no response from the congregation. I'm going to have to speak louder. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. I hear pages rustling. I'll wait till everybody gets there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And you ever notice how the whole world is kind of the opposite of this? You know what I mean? People are running around, worried about money. But God is telling us to be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Be joyful in your giving. Be thankful. Later on we're going to look at the... Uh, in the New Testament, where the, the widow gave her two mites, it added up to a cent. And Jesus said, she gave more than all those rich people. Because she gave out of her need. And I dare say she was joyful about it. We need to be joyful. Everybody here happy this morning? Huh? We're all happy? How comes I don't see any smiles? Everybody's sitting in the room. Beach. I'm talking about money. Oh my. Money. Just think what would happen if you had all the money in the world. What would you do with all the money in the world? Yeah. Build the church. <laughs> in the... Uh, discipleship hour last this morning I was with our teenagers and we were talking about money and it's interesting to note how much they know about money and understand about money whether it would be for shoes or purses or as I call it war paint war paint makeup <laughs> 
Oh my. But we're to be joyful. That was the first thing I, I, I came across. One of the, the first concepts. Be joyful. Be joyful. And the next one was, <clears throat> don't stop giving. Don't stop giving. You know, me and Pastor Rich have talked about this, and I've looked at this over the years. When things financially get tight in the economy, where's the first place that people decide to kind of, well, I, I better hold back a little bit. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get the tacos this week or the burritos or a roast beef, right? I don't, I don't want to fudge on the groceries, you know, and, and, and we've got to pay the electric bill. We've got to pay the gas bill. And uh, oh, oh, we got to pay the insurance bill. <laughs> right? Everybody has bills. But it, it normally happens when the economy gets a little tighter. Where's the first place that people kind of pull back a little bit? Church. Well, they figure God has all the resources. I mean, he don't, what, he don't need it, does he? Does God need anything? No, he don't need anything. Then why are we supposed to give if He has everything? God, why do you want us to give something when you have it all? The cattle on a thousand hills? Right? What does giving do to us? When we give our tithe, which is 10%, and we go beyond and we give sacrificially, and we give gifts to God, does He not bless us? Right? When you give and you fill, empty the cup in the church, okay? We empty it out into the, into the world for His kingdom. Doesn't He fill that cup up again? Is your cups getting filled up? Sure. How many times have you gone through a month going, there is not going to be enough money? I just know it. I sit down and I do the numbers. I get the calculator out. Because, you know, I don't add real well anymore. I'm getting decrepit. And I go through that and I go, the calculator doesn't lie, does it? No. And you go through it again, come up with the same amount. Calculator doesn't lie. Lord, what am I going to do? And at the end of the month, you made it. How many times has that happened to people such as myself, has happened to me. You raise your hand, has it happened to you? Isn't that amazing? It's like the calculator didn't lie. There wasn't enough funds. And I prayed about it. And God blessed. So if He's blessing you and He's blessing me, we should keep giving. Because as we keep giving, God keeps blessing. The blessing stops when we stop giving to His kingdom. Tithes, gifts, and offerings. I know of two people this past year who bought the, the chick tracks that we gave away in the, in the parades, right? That wasn't, say, a tithe to the church. That was a gift. Those two people were in effect, giving a gift so that they could plan it into the kingdom. And there was over 2,000 tracks that got handed out. And I think of those 2,000 tracks as 2,000 seeds that went out. <clears throat> and I know a certain person in my household said, well, we, we gave all those seeds out. We, we gave all those tracks out. And and nobody came to, to our church. I said, well, if you go out and take a corn seed and you plant it in the ground, you don't go out the next day to see if there's a full-grown corn stalk with ripe corn on it. We planted seeds. Sometimes it takes a little time for seeds to grow. I mean, we planted them out in the earth of humanity and God has to work His miracle of growing. Don't stop giving. I asked the uh, teenagers, I asked them, what question did I ask you? 
before we left class. You don't remember. Say, can you rob from God? Can you steal from God? Okay, Bob says, yep. Pastor Rich says, yep. I have some people going, I'm not quite sure. Can we rob from God? Okay, who gets up into heaven and steals his money? Somebody's up there getting the gold out. They're prying up street pavers, right? Get a street paver in my pocket. I'm going to get out of here real quick. One of those street pavers is going to be, whoo, man, I'm set for life down here on earth. Can you rob from God? Now there's a concept. And we're going to go to the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi. Malachi. The very next is Matthew. So Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, starting in verse 8. I found this very interesting. Here Malachi is having a conversation with God, okay? Chapter 3, Malachi, it's the very last book in the Old Testament. Just before we get to Matthew, huh? Chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. There was a quandary, uh, I had a quandary when I was reading this because as we go on and I'll explain it, there's, there's, there's something in there that... that that I didn't quite get. And I had to really look around and, and kind of search this out. But let me read it to you. And this is God talking to Malachi. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in tithes? Or how have we rob, robbed you? Question mark. And then he answers it in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And he's talking to the nation of Israel here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows... It's that cup thing. He opens up heaven, he fills up the cup. And you have such a blessing, you, you can't contain it. You're like, I've been blessed. But it says, test me on this. I believe that this is the only place in the Bible where God is saying, you can test me on something. And I find it extraordinary because he's asking us to test him on finances. On finances. On money. This is what we have to use nowadays because we don't have farms. We don't have cattle and sheep and goats and we can't bring a goat to the school here and offer it up as we don't have burnt offerings and stuff. But if someone brought a goat, we could have a goat roast. We all get together and bring baked beans and potluck and, and we have goat. Anybody want goat? I like goat. You know we goat? No? Well, you eat beef, don't you? What happens if they bring a bull and we put a bull out there on the spit, right? You'll come? You'll come for beef but not goat. What about sheep? Well, sheep, lamb chops. Oh, they're delicious. A little mint jelly. Oh, my goodness. But isn't that amazing? God says, test me. You test me. And what's he saying? He says, bring the tithes in so that my house will have food. I know this is in the Old Testament time. They're, they're bringing it into the temple. But we're the temple. Not this building, but each of us. The Holy Spirit is in us. We shouldn't stop giving. Because when we give, say, to the congregation, you give your tithes. What do we do with that? It goes out. It goes out of missions work. It goes out into the community. It gets spent, some of it, amongst ourselves. 
to help each other. But I can testify, Rick Heise can tell us that at the end of the year, there's nothing left. We have an empty cup. And we go into the new year going, oh, I know the Lord's going to bless us. He's going to fill that cup up again. Amen? Amen. God has been good to us. We're just a little teeny tiny church sitting in a little teeny tiny auditorium. And yet, God has blessed us. We, we pay our bills. We make sure the pastor's taken care of. And we do mission work. Amen. What, what more is there? I remember I was in a church one time. They had lots of funds. Lots of funds, right? Oh, well, we can't touch those funds. And I said, well, wh why not? Oh, we need that for a rainy day. I looked at this young lady and I said, obviously you haven't read your Bible. God's not going to flood the earth again. That was Noah's time. You don't need flood insurance. You need fire insurance. Amen? Amen? She got mad at me. She actually got mad at me. I was just telling her the truth. So we can't stop giving. We want to keep giving. Because what happens when we give? God gives. He never stops giving. Doesn't He take care of us? I know He does. Sources and resources. Sources and resources. This is the next one that really got me kind of going there a little bit. The third one is do what you can and let God do the rest. All right? And the example that I got when I was looking at stuff, the example was this person lost their job, right? Lost their job. They're going, God, I need a job. So what did they do? Well, they went home, got a six-pack of Yingling lager, big bag of potato chips, and sat down in front of the TV watching um, Jerry Springer. Okay? He wanted to laugh at people that are worse off than he is. So there he is sitting there. Lord, I don't see that job yet. Potato chips sitting there drinking beer. Do you think God's going to bless him? I don't think so. He's not doing anything. He's just sitting there. Right? Do what you can do. Sometimes you have to cut back a little bit. You may have to get rid of some subscriptions. Okay? Maybe get rid of the Comcast, cable TV or direct TV or something like that for a little while. Okay? Maybe you have to cut back on food a little bit. We're going to have chili more this week than we're going to have filet mignon. Right? Sometimes you have to cut back a little bit. Do what you can do and let God do the rest. Let God handle the things that you can't do. But don't just sit there waiting like that gentleman who's looking for a job. You know what I mean? You... You, I'm not saying you're helping God, but you're putting forth the effort to say, God, I know you're going to bless me. And I'm going to get ready for that blessing. I'm going to put out resumes. Maybe I'll take a class. I'm going to hunt for a job instead of sitting in front of the TV with a six-pack of beer and a bag of potato chips. You do that long enough, you're not going to be a desirable employee. You're going to be slow of wit, because you're drunk, and you're going to be slow of, <laughs> you're going to be slow of uh, stature because now you can't get off the, the sofa. And if you're married, your wife's not going to be happy because there's potato chip crumbs and empty beer cans all over the floor. Right? Do what you can do. Do what you can do in every situation and let God handle the things you can't handle. Be ready. Be vigilant. Be open-minded. Source and resources. How do we walk by faith and not by sight in our finances?
Now here's one that people, here's one you're going to really like. You're going to really like this one, okay? I know you're going to love this one, this point. Don't make excuses. How often have we made excuses in our finances? How often? How often have we made excuses when God didn't bless us at the moment we wanted the blessing? Lord, I need it now, right now. Never thinking that the Lord's trying to teach you a lesson, trying to teach me a lesson. Don't make excuses. I find that more and more everywhere I go. In every walk of life. In almost every situation. People make excuses. When did you get that done? Well, it was pouring down rain. The trench was filling with water. And I didn't feel like getting out of the truck. People make excuses all the time. My children make excuses. Why did you take a crayon and write all over the wall? Well, I don't know. The wall was clean and it looked like it needed a picture. <laughs> Do you know we have to clean that off now? Well, no, I like the picture. Besides, it's in my bedroom. Yeah, but your bedroom's in my house. And that's my paint. I bought the paint to put that on there. But people are always making excuses. People make excuses in their finances. I have to have that $672 cell phone. I can't function without that cell phone. If I couldn't text and Facebook and Twitter and Bipper and whatever type of things that they have, all kinds of acronyms they come up with, how you can communicate with somebody without actually communicating with them. <clears throat> they make excuses all the time. Why? I, I need that $472 a month cell phone bill because I must stay connected. Right? Could you live with just a landline? Oh, heaven forbid, a landline. Oh, you're, you're taking me back to my, to the, to the 1700s, my great grandparents. They only had landlines. We need a cell phone. Instant access. Okay? What about your finances? Do you make excuses when the Spirit comes upon you and says, give that amount to my church? Right? The thought comes in your head as you're making out the check or you're pulling the cash out of the envelope in the morning to come for, you know, to church to give the offering. And that little voice in the back of your head, it kind of sounds like your voice and it has sort of that that outworldly type sound to it. Give this amount. And you're going, oh, wait, I can't give that amount. Um, the kids got to go to the whatever, or man, I need a new purse. Or, or I need a new gun. <laughs> There's that gun Cabela's has on sale. Wait a minute, Lord. I'll give you this amount so I have enough to go get that gun. <coughs> People make excuses all the time. And we're down to, um, as I was telling you earlier, the widow's offering, which is in Matthew chapter 12. And everybody's heard this story, Matthew chapter 12. But it's an extraordinary story. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Mark. Mark chapter 12, right after Matthew. That's what got me all confused. I'm right there in Matthew, and I'm thinking Matthew, but it's actually Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Starting in verse 41. Matthew, or uh, Mark, sorry. Mark, chapter 12, verse 41. And he, our Lord sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent, a penny. 
calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Can you imagine what would happen to the Christian churches and I'm just going to use America, okay? That if they walked into uh, church Sunday morning with their paycheck in their hands, signed over to whatever church, and threw it in the offering plate. Could you imagine what would happen? Some churches would just fill their cup and keep it. But other churches would pour that cup out into other people's lives. When I read about this widow, and I prayed about it, and I thought about it, I thought, you know what? Here is a soul that is trusting in God. God is her source. Why else would she give all that she had? Everything. That whole scent in there had nothing else to live on. She couldn't buy any food. She had to be trusting on God. Had to be. Why else would you do that? God was her source. And those copper coins were just a resource. God was her source. The next one the topic we're looking at is don't worry. And we're looking at Luke chapter 12, verse 22 to 31. This is where Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll let you turn to that and look at it and I'll paraphrase it. My Father in heaven, He feeds the birds. He feeds the animals. He clothes the lilies of the field. And Solomon in all his array wasn't as handsome as the lilies. God knows. Our Father knows that you need to eat. You need to have clothes. And yes, He knows you have to pay your insurance so you can drive. You have to pay the electric bill or Dave comes and turns it off. He knows all that stuff. So when you get to the end, Luke chapter 12, verse 22. I just had someone point at me. Where are we at? (laughs) But God knows all this stuff. You think He knows? I know He knows. I know He knows. Because He's blessed me. When you get up against that financial wall sometimes, you're like, I'm not sure I'm going to make it this month. And somehow, some way, He provides You know, people are worried right now. They're worried to death. They're running all over the place. They're so worried that they would pick Donald Trump to run the country. I'm not telling anybody to vote for him. But a lot of people I run to get, yeah, I want to vote for him. He's different. He's not a politician. They can't do any worse than the person that's in there. That's worry. People are worried. Is anybody worried here? Be truthful. Anybody worried here? You get a little worried now and then? Oh, I'm worried about things. Some things. And I try not to. And when I start worrying about something, what do I do? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. There's those two words again. Source, resource. Source and resource. God knows you need all these things. Let's not worry about it. Let's get beyond worry because Satan uses that as a hook to get in you, to get you to do things you shouldn't do, to get you down. I'd rather be a happy person than to be a glum person walking around going, oh, I'm really worried about it. 
Yeah, I don't know if there's going to be enough money. China's doing things out in the Pacific. Oh, our word. Oh, my. You know, what's going to happen? You can pile all kinds of stuff on your plate to worry about. And a lot of them you have no control over. So why worry? Source and resource. And now we come to the last one. The last one we're looking at. Whose money is it anyway? Whose money is it anyway? Is it your money? It's your money, right? Oh, I just found 20 bucks in my pocket. <laughs> Ooh, money, money, money. <laughs> Who remembers some songs that they sing about money? Okay, I'm going to bring a couple of them up, all right? Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, the song Money. Dun, 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 dun. Money, right? They sing about it. Huh? Huh? Some of the, now, if you remember that, that album, you're probably much older than you younger people, and they're going, what is he talking about? Okay? But how many songs have there been written about money? Money. People chase after money. People die for money. All the time. Whose money is it anyway? It says here, on the very top above Jackson, I will read it to you, Federal Reserve Note. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. It's not yours. It belongs to the Federal Reserve System. They've loaned it to you. So that you can move value, what you did at work today, into another realm so that you can buy food. You don't actually own this. Whose money is it anyway? Now, Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 and 22. Ooh, twenty dollars. Of course, twenty dollars didn't buy, don't buy as much as it used to. I remember when twenty dollars would have lasted me a whole week as a teenager. I could have bought gas and got into trouble. I won't go into that. My poor wife knows, but Matthew twenty two, chapter fifteen. Tribute to Caesar is about paying taxes. Who likes paying taxes? Pastor likes paying taxes. I'm going to have to have a long talk with him. <laughs> you got to pay your taxes. It's, and it all boils down to, who does this belong to? Whose is it? Get back to my, my, my page flipped on me. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him, Jesus, in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial in any way. Ooh, talk about snaky words coming, you know. They're buttering him up. Jesus, hey, we know you're really great. Uh-huh, yeah, we know you're great. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful, lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? There's the question. A poll tax. But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said, Whose likeness or inscription is this? And they, had said, and they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said, to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Source and resource. God is our source. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? That's in the Old Testament, Psalm 50. It states in there, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. What isn't said there is he also owns the thousand hills. So if God is our source, 
That makes everything else a resource. If one resource dries up, if two resources disappear, if you lose a resource over here, all you have to do is go to God who is the source and ask. And you shall receive. We walk by faith, not by sight. The rest of the world out there, because Satan is blinding them spiritually, are walking by sight. They care about money, power. They care about who they are, how they look in the community. They walk by sight. And they're going to walk straight into hell. And they think their money's going to buy them out of that. The money's not going with them. When they die, I've never seen a hearse with a U hole behind it. Never seen a hearse with a U hole behind it. Oh, I have Marion here. Okay. <laughs> the plan shifted a little bit. That's all right. The kids are all here. Who is your source? What is your source? You can always tell how people act what their source is. When Wall Street goes crazy, people jump out of buildings because the money just went away. Right? They get on the computer, looking up their checking account, banking account, savings account, and it's going zero, 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 zero. Ah, oh, I'm done. Where's the window? That was their source. Think about it. People, whatever they have their source and believe in is what is guiding them. If it's money, it's a 401k, if it's your job, if it's whatever it is. Always remember in your head, if you get nothing from this sermon, you take nothing away from what I've told you, Take those two words with you every day and look at every situation in your life. Source or resource. And that will help you decide biblically what you're supposed to do. Source or resource. It's that simple. You can take that with you every day. And you can look at other people when they're coming at you or they're causing problems. Look what they're doing in their lives. Look what they're doing to you or to other people. What is their source and what is their resource? If their source is in themselves and I want to look great and I want to be, you know, all that to everybody and I'm going to stomp on you to get what I want, they're their source. They're their own source. Right? Remember, the serpent said to Eve, you will be like God. Okay? And that's what this whole world's about. If you're not a Christian, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're playing your own little God. And it's going to end not well. Would you pray with me? Father in Heaven, You are our source. And in You is all the resources that we would ever need. So I pray that You help us to always look to You as our source and to never look to anything else in our lives. The money, anything. The fame, the stature, no matter what it is. May it always be just a resource. And may You always be the source that we look to in our lives. And all the congregation said, Amen.